Hello, welcome to the English Like a Native podcast, the listening resource that's designed for intermediate to advanced level English learners. My name is Anna, and in today's episode, you're going to hear lots of wonderful vocabulary. If, however, you find yourself a little lost, if you're not familiar with many of the words and phrases that I use, then I highly recommend that you go back a few episodes and listen to last week's English five-a-day episodes. So in week six of the English five-a-day, I've been introducing and deep diving into lots of the vocabulary you're going to hear today. So that should be helpful for you. I'll put all the links to those episodes down in the show notes. But for now, let's get on with the show. The Christmas season is once again upon many of us. It's not easy to escape, but after all, why would you want to? The list of seasonal pleasures just goes on and on. Getting to spend more time with your family, rich food that you can only eat once a year, several days off work, presents. For a huge number of people, their day-to-day life is turned upside down by the holiday season. Not literally upside down, of course, but put into disorder, confusion and chaos. You know what I'm talking about. Everything seems to stop for precision shopping, mass baking and plenty of opportunities for a festive drink or two or three. (laughs) I actually have some church going friends who refuse to wish me or anyone else a Merry Christmas because they associate the word Merry with being drunk. They and others believe that being happy is one thing, but being merry is quite another. So it is that for several days during the last week and a half of December, normality seems to come to a halt. To come to a halt, this expression means to physically cease moving, to stop, but also more metaphorically to stop progressing. There's a perfect example of this in my town at the moment where they're supposed to be converting an old Lido or open air swimming pool into a fun fair. Well, the contractors seem to have removed most of the old interior, but after starting on the new flooring, all actual construction work has come to a halt. In fact, you could say that it's come to a grinding halt. As work was progressing well until they suddenly stopped coming to work with no sign of resumption. Right then, please don't be thinking that this is yet another podcast about Christmas songs or turkey recipes. I think that's all been done to death, you know, which means overdone. So to be done to death is overdone, talked about too much to the point where we should just stop and consider another aspect of the festive season. So That said, let's have a look at a few unconventional ways to spend Christmas past and present. We've got a Christmas cast for you today featuring Charles Darwin, who introduced his famous theory of evolution by natural selection. We have the first president of the USA, the face of the one dollar bill, George Washington, one of Apollo's space missions and the slightly less well-known Catalonian poo log. (laughs) So let's sail back almost 200 years for our first story. On December 25th, 1833, Charles Darwin, author of On the Origin of Species, at just 24 years of age, found himself aboard the HMS Beagle anchored off the coast of Port Desire, now known as Puerto Decido, Argentina, as part of his momentous five-year voyage. Now, the word momentous is a bit odd because if we think about the moment part, it doesn't sound significant at all, but it is. Momentous means very important because of its effects on future events. So if something is momentous, it creates 
momentum. And Darwin's voyage on the Beagle was a scientific expedition that would eventually transform our understanding of the natural world. So setting out in December 1831, his goal was to explore the geological and biological wonders of the lands he and the crew would visit. But this Christmas Day, although he might well still have been working, he had time to record this in his diary about how the crew spent their time. After dining in the gun room, the officers and almost every man in the ship went on shore. The captain distributed prizes to the best runners, leapers and wrestlers. These Olympic Games were very amusing. It was quite delightful to see with what schoolboy eagerness the seamen enjoyed them. Old men with long beards and young men without any were playing like so many children. Certainly a much better way of passing Christmas Day than the usual one of every seaman getting as drunk as he possibly can. Darwin knew what he was talking about. The ship he was aboard, the HMS Beagle, was supposed to have set sail, that is to say, disembark from its port from Plymouth, England, on the 26th of December 1831, but the crew were still so drunk from Christmas Day that the voyage had to wait until the 27th when they had recovered sufficiently. Fortunately for science, they did manage to disembark and Darwin's experiences in various locations from the Galapagos Islands to South America exposed him to a vast array of unique ecosystems and species that challenged prevailing beliefs and left an indelible mark on our understanding of life on Earth. This wasn't a traditional Christmas celebration by any means, and there is an added quirk or peculiarity to the story which really distances Darwin's experiences even further away from the packaged form that Christmas comes in these days. According to his diary, Charles Darwin actually hunted his own Christmas dinner. In his entry for the 24th of December, he wrote that he actually shot and killed a 170 pounds, which is around 80 kilogram, ganarco, which is a relative of the llama, meaning all aboard the ship would have meat on Christmas Day. Now, we're going to embark on a different type of voyage next. It's one thing to spend Christmas Day on the other side of the world, like Darwin in Argentina, but quite another to spend it in space. That's exactly what the crew of the Apollo 8 mission did in 1968. In fact, they travelled around the moon and back. The primary goal of these three astronauts, Frank Borman, James Lovell and William Anders, was to orbit the moon, assess the lunar module's performance and test various systems in preparation for future lunar landings. But for everyone watching on TV, the most exciting aspect of the mission was its live television broadcast from lunar orbit on Christmas Eve, December 24th, 1968. During this broadcast, the astronauts famously read verses from the Bible and wished viewers on Earth a Merry Christmas. The broadcast was viewed by millions of people around the world, perhaps as many as a quarter of the world's population. From this mission, we also have the first photographs of planet Earth taken by human hand, including the famous Earthrise. What really leaves me a little breathless about this event, though, is something which happened completely out of sight and out of earshot of anyone on our planet. Although we know that on the 27th of December 1968, Apollo 8 splashed down safely in the Pacific Ocean, this was far from being a guarantee at the time. In order to break out of their lunar orbit, the crew had to perform the trans-Earth injection which is a propulsion manoeuvre designed to set Apollo 8 back on course to Earth. But 
They had to do this from the so-called dark side of the moon, out of radio contact with mission control. A failure in the system would have meant that Apollo 8 would have been stuck in orbit of the moon with no means of escape and no hope of rescue. The anxious hours passed until voice contact returned and on Christmas Day, astronaut Lovell announced to Houston, please be informed, there is a Santa Claus. The crew had got the spacecraft out of orbit and a couple of days later, they were all safely delivered home. Whew. This sort of thing doesn't happen every Christmas, but I want to finish with something that does, at least in one part of the world. We're going to get traditional, yes, but of course with a difference. I think it's fair to say that the city of Barcelona is world famous for its successful football team, modernist architecture and beautiful beaches. Christmas in the Catalan capital and the rest of Catalonia, though, gives us something even more remarkable. Cagatillo, or Pulog, a cherished custom featuring a unique festive character in the form of a smiling wooden log. There are some logs that you can throw onto the wood fire, but not this one. In early December every year, families in Catalonia go into the woods or maybe just into the garden if they have a large one and they look to see if their tío has arrived. Perhaps the first thing that they'll see is the tip of its traditional beret called a baratina. Or it could be its painted smile, large white eyes or short stick legs. As all Catalan children know, it's best to check under large piles of leaves first, as Tio needs to keep warm in order to be able to carry out its very important role. Tio comes to the same family every Christmas, but only if they treat it well enough. You see, Father Christmas doesn't traditionally come to Catalonia. The children actually have to wait until the night of the 5th of January when the three wise men come to town bringing presents to open on the morning of the 6th of January. In the meantime, it's Tio's role to provide them with small presents to tide them over. To tide someone over can be a very important act if they don't have enough money or enough of something that they need in order to be able to sustain themselves or their family. So you tie them over, you keep them going, you sustain them. Now, I don't know about you, but as a child, I celebrated Christmas on the 25th of December. So I feel sorry for these poor Catalan children that they have to wait until they're almost back at school before opening their Christmas presents. I think they definitely need something to tie them over until then. So throughout the weeks leading up to Christmas, children take care of Tio, placing it in the living room, and providing it with fruit, nuts and other small treats on a plate within easy reach. Tio won't eat while people are watching though. But if it feels at home, then every morning the family will find the plate empty and Tio still smiling. It's the children's responsibility to keep Tio warm too, typically by covering it with a small blanket. So what about the poo part? Well... <laughs> The grand finale of Cagatillo takes place on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. In a joyous and light-hearted family ceremony, children gather around the log and, while tapping it gently with long sticks from the forest or the garden, they urge it to poo out something that they like, such as turrens, which are a type of nougat-based confectionery which is typically eaten with various fillings in Catalonia during the festive season, or small toys. If Tio doesn't poo anything out, then everyone has to sing louder and hit harder before checking under its blanket to see what it has produced. It's essential, too, that after every session of hitting and singing, someone takes the children to the bathroom or the kitchen to clean their sticks and allow Tio a few moments to recover from its exertions. Finally, because this podcast is an English language learning resource, 
I want to give an honourable mention to George Washington. An honourable mention is a form of recognition given to signify that the recipient's work, performance or contribution was noteworthy and praiseworthy, even though they did not win a top prize in a competition. Well, during a critical stage of the American War of Independence, the then General George led a crossing of the Delaware River in the early morning hours of December 26, 1776, which was critical in revitalizing the then dejected American side. Facing bitterly cold weather and an ice-filled river, Washington and General John Sullivan directed the arduous and dangerous crossing, somehow transporting all their troops, artilleries and horses across before embarking on a nine-mile march through snow and freezing rain to reach Trenton. There, they launched a surprise attack on the unsuspecting Hessian garrison, who were actually German soldiers fighting on the British side. Unsuspecting means that they didn't suspect or have any idea that something was about to happen, but it was, and it did. The battle was a resounding success for the Americans, and it gave hope and renewed confidence in the fight for independence. The war was far from over, but the Americans had turned the tide, so to speak. Things were not going their way, but through a great effort, they were able to change the course of history. What do you think things would be if America had remained a British colony? What would the English language be like? So, there we have a few unconventional ways of spending Christmas past and present. How will you spend yours this year? Hopefully, you won't have to cross a freezing river or perform an extremely rare propulsion (laughs) manoeuvre. It might be a good idea to play a few games or do a bit of exercise, but my bet is that if you're anything like me, you will end up singing and eating like the Catalans. Whatever you do, whenever, wherever, and however you do it, I hope that you have a wonderful Christmas time. Happy holidays to you all. Until next time, take very good care and goodbye.